we're here to talk about identifying impact unicorns. So we're here, in other words, to talk about animals that don't exist, to discover whether animals that are scarce could be less scarce. Or put another way, we're here to ask what it would take, what we would have to do, what we would have to commit to for the current global crop of $1 billion valuation private companies to be impact companies. And we're not sure what those things should be called. We're calling them impact unicorns. Zebras has been proposed. Um, successful would be another description. I think we should coin the right name for those companies over the next two years. So to help us figure out this very important question, we're joined by a hugely distinguished panel, all of whom really exist. We don't have very long, so I'm not going to rehearse their many and various achievements since you know already. But Cheryl Dorsey is president of Echoing Green. Um, she has asked recently, in fact, as recently as yesterday, I think, on Twitter, um, whether we suffer a crisis of conformity in the financial sector. Um, we will ask her later. Um, on my right, and you know him and you heard from him earlier, Devi Shetty is the founder of Narayana. He has in his office a quote from Mother Teresa, and the quote is, the hands that help are holier than the lips that pray. Um, he treated her, and it's our treat to have him with us today. Kshama Fernandez, on my left, founded Northern Ark Capital. Northern Ark has provided about $7.5 billion of funding to underbanked sectors in the last decade. Uh, and she has also, and this I find absolutely astonishing, um, sailed across the Atlantic. On her left, Rima Nanavati runs SIWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, the single biggest union of informal sector workers in India, with about two million women members. Um, she describes... <laughs> she describes herself as a risk taker. So our brief is to ask what it would take to unlock the potential for more impact unicorns, to create more of them and support more of them. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists um, to address that um, in the order that I introduce them. Cheryl. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored to share the stage with these distinguished panelists. Um, as was mentioned, I am president of Echoing Green. For those of you who don't know, Echoing Green is a global community of social entrepreneurs with ideas for building a more sustainable and equitable world in order that all people had the opportunity to thrive. There are now 800 of us as part of the Echoing Green community who are now working in 80 plus countries around the world. I suppose I feel like a bit of an outlier on this panel because all of our work is impact first, impact only, in terms of the lens or filter we use to identify the social entrepreneurs in whom we invest. Um, so I think my vantage point might be of interest as we continue along with this conversation of what does it look like in the earliest stage of the investment pipeline for impact first social enterprises. I think there's good news in that there are many, many next generation leaders who are thinking about new business models, who are disrupting the fields in which they hope to work in really innovative and interesting ways where they're not at all sacrificing for impact. So again, I think in terms of the scale or the number of enterprises that are going after impact, the view is good from the earliest stage where I sit. Thanks. I uh, come from the healthcare background and uh, just want to uh, tell you that the global healthcare and wellness industry is the largest industry in the world. Currently, it is about $8.2 trillion. For your information, oil is only $2 trillion. Automobile is only $2 trillion, 
and healthcare industry is $8.2 trillion. But after spending $8.2 trillion, less than 20% of the world's population has access to safe, accessible, affordable healthcare, especially for secondary and tertiary level healthcare. Now, what do we do for the 80% who don't have access to decent healthcare? Today, there is a solution. The solution is digitizing healthcare. When you convert atoms into bytes, amazing things happen. And we believe that the world's largest healthcare provider is going to be a software. It is very, very important that impact investors and everyone who wants a better society must invest on building this software infrastructure. Why this is important? It's predominantly because when you hear somebody is unwell, 99% of them don't need operation. When I don't need to operate, I don't need to touch. And if I don't need to touch, I don't need to be there. I can be anywhere. India has 70 million diabetics, and there are 600 diabetologists. How are you going to treat all the diabetic patients? We have a hospital. This is not a developing country's problem. It's a developed world's problem as well. We run a hospital in Cayman Island. Caribbean region has close to 40 million people living, 29 island nations, 7,000 islands, and each island has 50,000 to 100,000, 200,000 population. Can they afford to have a diabetologist, cardiologist, endocrinologist living there? It's not possible. So if you have a digitized healthcare where online healthcare becomes a reality, we can offer healthcare to everyone on this planet. And it is possible. And the technology is already available. And if there is one country which can develop this is India, but someone has to make sure it happens. Thank you. I will, I will come back and ask who the someone is in that sentence. Chama. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was just looking at some of the numbers and because we were talking about unicorns and especially unicorns in impact finance, uh, we have about 14 so-called unicorns that have come out of the Indian market. And if I look at them very closely, some of them are borderline financial impact, but most of them are not in the financial impact space. Um, all of them doing very interesting work, all of them touching populations, creating jobs and so on and so forth, and in some sense indirectly creating an impact, but not, not directly so. Uh, why, uh, why, is it, why, why is it the case and what will it actually take us to have more number of financial impact uh, unicorns? Uh, here's the distinction and here's the challenge. So, you know, the unicorns we know and many of you know the names. I'm not going to talk about the names. These are largely entities that have sort of leveraged off networks. These are aggregators or in the aggregation space and so on. Why not, uh, why aren't we seeing the emergence in the financial uh, impact space and I'm going to talk about financial institutions because that's the market I understand best. Uh, we work with about 150 such institutions, all of them working in sort of the underbanked space. Um, here's the challenge and I think this is really what I would like to focus on for the next uh, 30 seconds or so. One is when you're talking about financial impact, financial inclusion, you're really dealing with the most vulnerable of all populations. So if you apply the classic unicorn matrix of grow fast, I think it needs to be done slightly more carefully in this space. Um, you know, the cost for failure in the financial impact space is very high. If you're going to use a cab aggregator and the aggregator collapses from a day to or one day to another, it's fine, you'll feel unhappy, but your life won't come to a grinding halt. When you're dealing with financial impact, it affects lives of people. The second point, is that the impact is very, very long-term in nature. You know, I mean, selling somebody an insurance product, selling a 60-year-old individual a life insurance product is a problem. Sell selling something that is incorrect from sort of a long-term large loan perspective to somebody who cannot repay it could result in a child being pulled out of school. These are not small implications. So the implications of getting it wrong are very severe. And third and last, I think being in the financial impact space can create systemic implications that go just merely beyond that individual 
unicorn. So I think the point I'm really trying to make is that I think one of the requirements of, for creating financial unicorns is of course capital and we all understand that in this room. I think the most important environment one really needs to create is that of regulation. I think when the regulatory environment one creates the infrastructure for good supervision, good governance and so on is enabled, I think we will see more unicorns coming. And secondly and more importantly, I think that if there is a little more care in terms of ensuring that the regulatory environment is stable and doesn't keep changing on a frequent basis, so institutions, entrepreneurs, entities who really put capital behind building these unicorns are not put in a position of loss or shock from one day to another just because the regulatory environment changed, I think those will be impactful factors. Thank you. Reema. Um, thank you so much and namaste. I speak here on behalf of my two million sisters, all poor but economically very active women workers. And I may not be speaking the language that you all have been used to listening, unicorns and impact, all that is very new and alien. All what I mean to say is that, you know, I call upon you all to step up, step out, and, you know, um, think of how do we invest together or co-create, you know, kind of financing instruments um, that will help uh, create a need for a blended pool of finance which provides uh, risk capital at a rate that is affordable to the women and it helps in strengthening capacities, provides technical support which in strengthen the businesses to scale and replicate. Um, we don't need the poor to remain poor. Poor also do not want charity, um, but poor need partnership poor need investment in the risks and also hand-holding support. So I think financing livelihoods with credit enhancement and following an integrated approach to livelihood security is the best way of linking producers with the mainstream markets. So I think the overarching objective I would really like to harp upon is to help nourish, promote, and nurture women-owned micro-enterprises and creation of a scalable enterprise with large-scale economic, social, environmental impact of, um, for the wheels of the pyramid producers. And this is what a country like India needs if we have to create decent, dignified, meaningful work for the millions and millions of the youth in our country. Thank you. So do, do we think there's any contradiction between the last two things we heard, which is that of a very patient and rather careful development of impact entities, and what we heard from you, Devi, which has sounded more urgent, more along the lines of grow fast, break things? Do we think there is any inherent contradiction in these two positions? You first. See, the <clears throat> if you tell me that if we continue with the pace of development, 50 years from now, everybody is going to have health care. I'm not interested. I want this to happen now. And solution exists. It's a matter of making it available to everyone. And we are in this wonderful world wherein when you convert atoms into bytes, the entire concept of how much it costs disappears. If I have one kilo of rice, I give you half a kilo of rice, I lost my half a kilo of rice. If I develop a software to interpret a ECG to save lives, I use it on my patients, and I can give a copy of the software to the whole world, they can enjoy what I am having, and I haven't lost what I have. And this is what needs to be done in healthcare. It adds, it doesn't subtract. I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm trying to start an argument here. Kshama. Okay, let me add to that argument. <laughs> um, well, I think the whole um, concept of financial impact uh, unicorns itself is somewhat incorrect. Um, 
And we, we can surely go on there and with an rename argument. it. <laughs> we can surely go on and call unicorn something else. Uh, the point I'm really making here is to say that surely we, we see a lot of institutions working in the financial impact space who have delivered the returns and who've gone to the $1 billion valuation and, and whatever else in the, in the global markets. But I don't think that really ought to be the benchmark when we're looking at it. Uh, I think the opportunities are huge if we go after something that is of a scale and of a magnitude that 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 is that is something that is present in the Indian market today. The valuations will come. So I think the basic disconnect I have is to say that yes, sustainable uh, investments, yes, return on equity, yes, growth and all of that. But to measure impact and uh, talk about valuation sort of in the same metric may not be the right impact metric in my opinion. Now the question is, what else should we look for? When when sorry, just just a point of clarification. When you specifically talk about financial impact, do you mean the positive social impact of financial inclusion, or do you mean um, uh, positive financial results? I think we can measure it in multiple ways, and I think one of the uh, points that uh, Rima made here was uh, the number of lives they have touched at SEVA. I think that's a great metric. Uh, the metric that we use at Northern Arc is really the amount of financing we have uh, enabled for the underbanked. It has nothing to do with the valuation of Northern Arc, and I hope that Northern Arc gets a great valuation. Uh, but the fact of the matter is really the matrix we use is to say how much more capital have we catalyzed through the work we do. And I think those are the kind of measures we might have to look when we talk about financial impact. Cheryl. Yeah, I, again, I'm not going to be provocative. I think I really am very much aligned with, I would say, the women from Siwa who sort of look at the work and how they walk through the world through the lens of sort of movement building. You're building community. And I think very much what we're trying to do at Equine Green is being part of the ecosystem to better support impact entrepreneurs to go out into the world to get the capital that they need, to get access to the networks that they need, and to also um, be evaluated where sort of optimizing around social returns is deemed worthy and important to sort of drive social and environmental uh, change at scale. But there is a lot that we need to be done. I mean, clearly this is about um, urgency and using the power of movements um, to really drive that change more quickly. But when you look at the state of play today, there's a lot more we have to do. As I mentioned, um, so many social entrepreneurs, women, people of color, proximate leaders are just locked out of these capital networks. The data exists. You see these incredibly talented entrepreneurs, um, but because they um, look a particular way or come from a particular background, they're not getting access to this capital. Um, and we know this. So I think part of the work of this field is how do we sort of change the equation and provide more equitable on-ramps um, to things, um, to that sorts of capital and access to those sorts of networks. I think we also um, need to do a better job um, of thinking about the kinds of supports that these entrepreneurs need. I think there's a lot of good anecdote from the explosion of accelerators and incubators and fellowship programs like the one that I run of the supports that these entrepreneurs need. We, we know it. So how do we start to scale it? We know folks need customized support. Um, to help these enterprises grow. We also know that they need curated matchmaking to funders. So let's do the, handing, the, the handoff to additional funders happen more quickly and more seamlessly. And last but not least, they need peer-to-peer -peer networks that allow them to exchange information and to bolster one another as they're trying to build these enterprises. So a lot of this stuff we already know how to do. We just need to do it, and we need to do it more quickly and at scale. Do, do I, just to follow up, do I hear in what you're saying that you see a failure of what I call intermediation rather than of capital supply. So in other words, there is capital, it's people don't know how to access it, the capital doesn't know how to shape itself to be accessible, business models are not yet proven. Is that, is that underneath what you're saying? Very much so, very okay. much so. So I think there is a role for um, both uh, intermediary organizations as well as sort of ecosystem builders to bring that all together and to um, create a chorus as opposed to people singing independently. Yeah, I, I, I have a different observation. I think the so-called civil society has created the regulations, legal structure in a manner that the people who are deprived can never break into the system and get the benefits of what society has to offer. We have twisted and we have made the regulation to suit our requirement. 
so that our monopoly about these things continue. I'll give an example. I see 60 to 100 patients in my outpatients every day, and I do at least one or two heart surgeries every day. And most of my patients are little kids sitting on a mother's lap. I examine the kid, and I look at the mother and tell her that her baby has a hole in the heart, and she requires an operation. She has only one question. It's not about the, how safe the operation is, how many days he will be in the ICU. It's about how much it is going to cost. And if I tell her that it is going to cost $1,000, which she doesn't have, that is the price tag on the kid's life. She comes up with $1,000, she's going to save the kid. If she doesn't have $1,000, she's going to lose the kid. Now, this is what I do as a doctor. This is what all the doctors in all the developing countries do from morning till evening, putting price tag on human life. Now, in the regulations what we have created, if you kill a child, you are punished. But you have got the skill to save the kid's life, but you don't need to do that. And we have escaped. How long this system will continue? What are you talking about equality? We have been unfair to the society. I think um, to all these, um, my colleagues who have just said, I think uh, my call would be that all of us sitting here need to build up the courage and, you know, to take up um, the challenge of creating a new kind of an instrument which will, um, you know, in, um, invest in the social enterprises. Are we all willing to invest in an enterprise which is owned by women who still do not have a proper roof on their home or who still doesn't even have thousand rupees or thousand dollars to treat her own child? And that's the kind of an investment which will have profound impact, which you may not be able to measure in terms of rate of return. But you are saving millions and millions of lives. You are creating livelihood opportunities for the ones who have been struggling, you know, and who have been on the margins or excluded. So it's the need of the R is a patient capital with a mix of risk funding and soft loans with the objective of facilitating business expansion, but also deepening. And what are the differentiators from the regular impact investing? It's a long-term view. Um, we need to take a long-term view of the poor making significant patient investments. The fund has to incorporate voices of the poor and amongst them women because they are the poorest of the poor. It should be the poor and the women who decide the need, the amount, the rate, the credit duration, uh, moderate returns to help the businesses to grow at pace that is comfortable to them. And I think the overarching objective would be to facilitate asset creation. I think that's the kind of an impact. And I think the underlying principle would be security of livelihoods, sustainability, and economic and environmental regeneration. That's what is what in our terminology a unicorn should be or, you know, an, or an impact investment fund could be. Otherwise, I think all other discussions on impact investment makes no sense and meaning to the women that I represent. I'm, I'm going to ask the, the, the most obvious question that we could ask in this group and I'm quite happy to be told it's a stupid question. Is it the case that if we were creating unicorns for impact, we would swap out a number of dollars in, market ca in, in capitalization for a number of humans impacted? And if so, what is that number and why wouldn't it be different depending on the context? Kshana. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you asked that question. It's a question we really asked as, uh, ourselves when we started Northern Arc 10 years ago, you know. Uh, we looked uh, around at the amount of requirement of capital that was there in the Indian market, and we thought that grant foundation is money is never really going to be enough to really meet that kind of requirement. And what we really attempted to do then 
was to say, how can we look at all of these underlying sectors and create a channel or a route to mainstream commercial markets? And that's really what we've achieved. I think it is really possible to bring the whole impact finance space and the commercial space together. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt that there is a role for both of these. I think what we really need to look at is the matrix. And I would not underemphasize the importance of bringing commercial capital. I think profit motive is good. I think profit motive and impact motive together is better. And we need to find ways to really do this together. Does it count if it has a million people rather than 100 million people in the system? It's very clear what a unicorn company is. It's private market capitalization of a billion dollars. And that doesn't vary anywhere in the world. If we aspire to build more of those, what are we aspiring to? Just technically, just definitionally. How many people would you have to be able to treat for it to... So this is the scale question, as it were, put, put in, a different, in a different form. I think... <clears throat> to solve the healthcare problems, the uh, we should. I don't think we need billions and billions of dollars. I'll I'll give you an example from our own experience. Le I am passionate about technology because technology, I believe, will dramatically transform healthcare. The, I'll give an example of how inexpensive these technologies are, provided it is developed by people who are ultimately going to use it. My son, who was doing his residency in cardiac surgery six years ago, it was mandatory for him to have a surgeon's logbook to enter all the details about the surgery, what he has assisted, what he has done. And he looked at all the versions of uh, surgeon's logbook, it was all desktop versions. And software engineers don't realize that doctors hate computers, but doctors are always with their mobile phone. So he wanted to develop a software which he can use as a surgeon on his mobile phone. So he borrowed few hundred dollars, few hundred dollars from me and developed a software in six weeks. It's called surgeon's logbook. His friends liked it. And they put it up in Play Store and Apple Play Store, the Apple uh, App Store and everywhere. It is available free of cost. 30,000 surgeons across the world use that application. And how much it costed? A few hundred uh, dollars. All I am trying to say is that whenever you make investment, you have to do in-depth study as who are the people I am funding, what is their domain knowledge? In the end, do they have someone to pay for it? Because software engineers in isolation have phenomenal idea about how healthcare should run. But in reality, it doesn't work like that. How we treat patients, how, what is the patient aspiration, and what are the legal implications, unless the hospitals and the doctors are part of the whole development system, no matter how much money you spend, in the end, that product will die. So this is the problem I see everywhere. It is not just about money. It's about the end users. I agree, money is like oxygen. Without oxygen, none of us are going to live for more than three minutes. But purpose of our life is not oxygen. So what I heard strongly restated in that answer was the the kind of triad that has underwritten the investment thesis of this entire event, which is to shift risk and return to risk, return, and impact, if I, if I heard you correctly. Um, um, I, I warned each of the panelists that I was going to ask um, each of them um, to make a kind of call for action, to um, ask you um, to act on their behalf the, for, um, in support of the things that they thought would unlock more pro-social, public benefit, just, whatever it is we think we're calling corporations that create risk, return, and impact in um, equilibrium. Um, so I'm going to, again, in the same order, starting with Cheryl, 
um, I'm going to ask each of them to ask you to do one thing that would mean that when we meet this time next year, um, we will have moved on our definitions of and the number of conformant investments and corporations. Cheryl, what is your call to action? There are many things we should all be doing uh, to sort of make this road while walking, um, but I'll go back to my initial um, and earlier comment around access um, and more equitable access um, to these networks, to these opportunities. Um, we are in the midst of such a global shift um, and people are fond of saying demography is destiny and they say it because it is true. And when we look around the world where we have a surfeit of young people, the emergence of new voices, people of color, proximate leaders who are coming into spaces like these, they deserve access to capital capital for the ideas that they are generating in their communities to make their communities better. So if all of us agrees to take a meeting with a young next generation entrepreneur who does not look like us, who does not come from our same um, social circles or educational background, please do it. Not only do they have sort of uh, a vision into their community and how to best solve the, uh, the problems in their community, uh, but they also um, could really benefit um, from the sorts of uh, networks, opportunities, capital stacks um, that you all um, have access to. So that would be my, my one ask of this group, and I'd love to come back next year um, to see this room look a little bit more diverse. Thank you. That's pretty clear. Uh, my request for the impact investors is to invest on technology to ensure that Healthcare gets dissociated from wealth of the nation. And technological solutions should be developed by a group of people who believe that when that solution becomes available, it should touch at least a billion population. If it is less than that, the effort is not worthwhile. Now, that can only happen if the software engineers, software developers, and the healthcare providers work together as one group. And then magic will happen. And it doesn't require millions and millions of dollars. With the modest investment, it can be done. And we believe once that happens, barriers will be broken. Today, healthcare Sitting in India as a doctor who's interested in children's heart problem, if there is a child suffering from the heart problem in Indonesia or many other countries, I am legally not allowed to treat because I don't have the license. Why do I don't have the license? Everyone wants to control their turf. But believe me, once you digitize healthcare, no one can come on the way. It is the people accessing healthcare from whoever they want. And this will dramatically transform everything what we consider as a norm today in healthcare. Thank you. It's interesting that you said a billion people because, of course, that is what I was hinting at someone to come up with as their definition of what our kind of unicorn might look like. Um, we, we may come back to that. Um, I think uh, finance and impact are businesses where people are the core asset. Uh, I think we have a lot of inspiring people in this room who are managing inspiring businesses and funds and so on. I think if we can actually attract a lot more people from mainstream businesses and mainstream finances, uh, financial institutions to get into the impact space, we will see a scale up um, that could actually be very, very fascinating. So that would be my, my ask. Seeing more and more people getting into the impact space, more and more commercial mainstream financiers getting into this space. So, can I ask a follow-up question? So, one of the things that has, um, that has characterized the, the, the world of um, uh, pro-social business over the last 20 years or so um, is that it's struggled with incentives, okay? Because incentives have been stronger um, for hiring um, in, uh, in conventional um, activities. And um, uh, ethical incentives have been stronger on this side. Um, and that has created a kind of market distortion for talent. 
How do you think we're at a point where that is evened out and we can fix that? I don't think it's at a point that, has, uh, that it has evened out, but I do think that there is, to really attract very high quality talent of the kind I'm speaking about, we will have to get the whole incentivization story right. Uh, because I, th the way the sector has developed uh, traditionally is that most people who've come, he come here have typically paid what one calls a mission discount. I think if you really want to get smart, educated, commercially incentivized people to come in, uh, you know, do the same scale up and the same work in the impact spaces, we need to create the right incentive structures because people have their responsibilities, you know. Everybody wants their kid to go to a good school. Everybody has elderly parents to take care. Everybody needs the health care and services uh, that they would get anywhere else. So I think if we can get that right, it will make it much easier. And that really brings me to my last point, uh, which is very, very much connected to the whole uh, return and impact or profit and impact space. I don't think profit is a bad idea. I don't think building an institution to do well and generate good valuations is a bad thing. I think we need to sort of make sure that while we do that, we don't lose focus on the core impact. And I think if we really have that in mind, then it will be possible to attract people who will come in, not just for the returns, but for the impact. And in my mind, it's very clear. Pure returns is interesting. Returns and impact is absolutely fascinating. And I think there'll be a lot more people who will want to chase that story in life. Thank you. Rima, your call to action. Um, I think my call for action would be that um, I would invite anybody who would want to co-create a fund which would invest um, in the uh, enterprises which are owned and managed by the um, women so that they are able to scale up and give meaningful, dignified jobs to millions of poor so that next year when there is the Global Impact Investing Summit, it is those women who would be here to share their experiences and call for more in investment. So that's what I would really call for action. So it's a co-creation and in that journey, how do we partner together, share the risk? And I would fully agree to what Shama is saying, that profit is not bad, it depends on how it's distributed. So I think that's what one has to also really look at, that how do you generate enough of surplus profit, but how do we also redistribute it so that, you know, it creates real profound impact. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Um, I now have two jobs, one very easy and one very difficult. Um, um, the easy one is to thank uh, panel, so I'll do that in a minute, and I'll do the difficult one first, which is to try to bring together um, some of the threads of what I think... Um, uh, these distinguished people have said. So um, I heard people talk about co-creation, the notion that we don't do things for or to people, we do things with them. I heard people talk about uh, patience and the necessary care we have to take when people's lives, rather than simply share value, are at stake. Um, it's slightly distinct from that, I heard uh, 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 about urgency, um, the need to move uh, fast because the scale of the problem um, is vast, but the presence of the solution um, is, uh, is clear. Um, I heard the exhortation to take a meeting, um, and I think what that meant was um, talk to people you don't talk to because it might well um, make a difference. I heard more or less across the piece, um, people talking about regulation um, uh, and the, fr the, the regulatory framing for all our activities needing to be adjusted. Uh, and the most striking example is the, uh, the notion that work that you develop can't be delivered in Indonesia, uh, for example. So we have to continue to be joined up um, and make the case for um, regulatory, and then choose your word, liberalization, harmonization, whatever it, whatever it is that would allow us um, to do things um, differently. I heard about the importance to create a new equilibrium um, with the mission discount, as you, uh, as you called it. Um, but I think I heard mostly uh, broad 
optimism. Um, I would add only one thing if I had a call to action. I don't know if I'm allowed one, but it would be that we do sooner or later need to get our language straight. Um, we wouldn't talk about um, non-impact investments as if they were all one thing. Um, we wouldn't use different terms at different points, meaning more or less the same thing. And we would be a whole lot better at branding as witness the branding of a contestable, shiftable, moving, um, uh, non-audited valuation. So those are our calls to action. It, I'm left only with the easiest and most pleasant job, which is to thank each of you for being amazing and disclosing and serious. Thank you all very much, and thank you.